everyone. Uh, it's getting late in the day. You've been hanging out. You look patient. Are you ready for a drink? Uh, uh, I uh, would like to apologize to the uh, folks I had lunch with today. Since I drank water, I seem to have uh, hurt my reputation somewhat, but I'm going to try to make up for it now. Um, I went into a bar last year with a couple of friends in New Orleans, where I live. Uh, it was a dark, smoky, hipster bar. Uh, there was some edgy folk rock playing in the background. There were some bookshelves set up on concrete cinder blocks and boards on the side. I assume it was filled with David Foster Wallace. I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> uh, uh, over in the corner, though, there was a bright light. It was, stood out like a roast beef warming station at a hotel bar. Um, <laughs> And over there, sitting there, was a woman uh, with cat's eye glasses behind a table, and she had a sign that said, nails painted, $10. And we thought, well, that's pretty cool in a multitasky kind of way. So my friend went over to get her nails painted. Uh, we sat at the bar. 20 minutes later, she joined us, uh, and we said, how was it? And she said, it was great. The person was very nice. We said, let's see the nails, and we looked at them. We were astonished. They were disgusting. They were horrible. There was, uh, it was streaky and splotched, and there was, it was on the cuticles. It looked like somebody had done her nails with an industrial paint roller. Um, and we talked about this. And why would somebody set up a nail operation like this if they had no skills, no evident passion, no evident interest in developing those skills? And we talked about, and you know, we speculated about this from things we've seen elsewhere. And it seems that uh, today, often, just having an idea is sufficient. Uh, the execution <laughs> is secondary. I think today, often, the, the craft gets trumped by just the concept. Um, now, hold on to that idea for a moment. I'm going to circle back around to it. Um, but uh, let's stick in the bar. Let's have a drink, or at least talk about cocktails and spirits, which is what I was asked to address today. Um, I'm a drinks writer. I'm paid to go out and drink. Uh, then I write about it. Uh, editors sent me to places like uh, London and Vancouver to check out what's going on with the bars in New Mexico, Kentucky, Cognac, to see what's happening at the distilleries, to see if there are any stories that need to be told. Uh, it's not a bad job. And just to um, <laughs> preempt the question I usually get, no, I'm actually not looking for an assistant, but thank you for asking. Uh, I got into this line of work somewhat improbably through uh, an interest in history. I was uh, reading a lot of American history, and I kept coming across references to rum, and I was fascinated by the fact that role, the rum played this role all through American history. It cropped up in piracy, it cropped up in the slave trade, it cropped up in the roots of the American Revolution. Uh, I spent two years researching a book uh, about this, and that led to my learning a lot more about contemporary cocktail culture of the 20th century, which led to editors giving me more jobs uh, to go to bars, which led to... Uh, led to uh, all sorts of uh, interesting adventures. Um, uh, it, it, I won't go into too many of them in too much detail. Uh, but I was sitting at a bar one day, and I, I met a guy, and I explained to him how I got into this. And he said, so let me see if I got this right. You got into drinking because you were reading history? He said, that's like somebody getting into sex because they read Darwin. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I don't deny it. It uh, doesn't make much sense, but it does go some way of explaining that, that I take, tend to take a longer view of uh, history, longer view of drinking than most do. When I go out, I'm not usually that interested in just what's trendy and what's new. I'm sort of looking uh, for what's out there uh, and putting it into some sort of a context. Now, uh, the best thing about the job for me has been that I've had a front row seat at this remarkable flourishing of a cocktail revolution over the last decade. Uh, when I started paying attention about a decade ago, there were maybe a half dozen notable co craft cocktail bars out there. Uh, today, I just can't even count them. I don't even pay attention to the ones that are opening. It's, it's, they're flourishing. There's, uh, there's you know, hundreds of them. They open every day. I met a guy a couple months ago who said he was opening an upscale craft cocktail bar in Starksville, Mississippi. It took me a moment to process that. that that's, we've gotten to that, that phase uh, <clears throat> where, where that's happening. Um, if you haven't been to a craft cocktail bar or are not quite sure what craft cocktails are, I'll explain briefly. Uh, they're, they're not the cocktails you got at the corner saloon. They're much fussier. They're much more expensive. They're handcrafted. Uh, they tend to use high-end liquors and mixers. There's fresh squeezed juices. Uh, there's uh, handmade tinctures and uh, bitters that go into it. Everything's handcrafted. It takes a lot longer than you would expect. It usually costs a lot more than you would want. Um, <laughs> as well. But it's uh, the, a couple things to look for to see if you're in a craft cocktail bar. One is uh, eyedroppers. 
If an eyedropper was involved in the making of your drink, you were in a craft cocktail bar. Precision is very big. Uh, and the second thing is uh, interesting facial hair. Uh, <laughs> craft bartenders seem to be inordinately uh, uh, drawn to, to that. There's a quote um, uh, that I like from a guy who spent a lot of time in bars. He said, in point of fact, uh, the American barkeeper is a genius uh, is, of his own making. Uh, he, he's a generally a personable young man, given with an immense, with an, with a, sorry, an immense predilection for very white linen uh, and whiskers. Um, I think this, it was written by a man named Howard Paul in 1860, and he was describing something like this. Uh, however, if you go into a bar today, uh, I think that you, <laughs> you might be surprised to be greeted by these uh, Edwardian gentlemen uh, who, were, who were there for you. Um, I've talked with quite a few of them, and they seem to think that this really helps me get into a role. They like to, to, to do the hospitality, and they like to, to live in the past. Um, the... Uh, the cocktail revival, well, the, the, the thing about the mustaches and the, the connections there, I mean, it's pretty clear uh, that there's a, a connection th between the past there. But the, uh, the cocktail, it's not, cocktail revolution is not really a revolution. This is not something that's new. Clearly, it's a revival. It's something that's come around. It's a revival of a revival of a revival. Uh, since the 1600s, Americans have socialized by going to uh, public houses. Uh, but every so often, Things seem to come together, technology, social, some social issues, economic, and there's a real flourishing of cocktail color, co uh, culture. Uh, it happened in the 1830s uh, when suddenly everyone wanted mint juleps and sherry cobblers. It happened in the 1860s, in the 1890s, in the 1920s during Prohibition when, when drinking went underground. Uh, and it happened again in the 1950s with the uh, Mad Men era. Um, I think the cocktail revival that we're going through today is, is certainly one of the most uh, robust, creative, and interesting, and, and uh, perhaps of all history, American history with one exception, I'd say the 1890s, there was also a golden age of cocktails that was uh, quite extraordinary. Uh, in that time, you had those men with their whiskers and their white linens creating really creative drinks. Uh, they were doing things that no one had done before. Uh, they were mixing things up like uh, aromatized wine and, uh, and, and spirits. Uh, and they came out with drinks that we know today as the Manhattan and the Martini. Um, that, these were not universally embraced. Some people would go into a bar and uh, say, uh, yeah, I don't want those newfangled drinks. Those are crazy. Give me an old-fashioned whiskey cocktail. Go back to the basics, spirits, sugar, and bitters. And so we had the, the, the old-fashioned cocktail come out. 1886 was the first public reference to that. It had a great revival <clears throat> in uh, the 1950s. And again, today, I think we're seeing uh, some extraordinary things. Um, it always amuses me when I hear people today criticize those that refer to themselves as mixologists, as being some sort of new pompous kind of thing. Uh, because mixologists, was, the word dates back to 1860 also. There was a great uh, quote from 1863, someone referring to a bar that said that had mixologists of fluid excitements, which I think is a great phrase. I would suggest that J.W. Marriott, which has a bar called mixology, change it to mixology of fluid excitements. Um, <laughs> I think that would... Uh, would make it a lot more interesting. Now, the, uh, the revival didn't just happen overnight. Uh, the revival came about because there were uh, a, a small coterie of obsessives, people that were really driven to, to research the past and make things happen. Um, here are three of them that uh, I think have done tremendous things to, to bring back history, and I think it's, 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 it's instructive and telling about how uh, these cycles happen. On the left, Dale DeGroff was at the Rainbow Room uh, in, the, uh, in New York City, uh, read some old history books and realized we were doing things wrong and brought back fruit, fresh fruit juices and got rid of lime, uh, Rose's lime juice and the like. Ted Hay in the middle. Uh, a Hollywood graphic designer who was obsessed with early history books, uh, recipe books, but he was really aggravated by the fact that he couldn't get a lot of the ingredients that were called for in uh, these books. So he set a, had a small army of people go out and recreate ingredients like Boker's Bitters and Batavia Arak and Pimento Dram that can be used. And on the right is Jeff Barry, who was a tiki archaeologist. He's obsessed with tiki cocktails from the uh, mid-century. And he... Uh, 
uh, I mean, a lot of those tiki, exotic Polynesian restaurants, you could not get uh, the, you didn't know what the recipes were. So the head barman would keep them secret, use secret containers, uh, and then when they left, they would disappear. If you were a head barman at Trader Vic's, uh, the last sight you might see on Earth on your deathbed is this man, Jeff Barry, peering down at you saying, what was the secret ingredient? And the La Apu Aku La Laplander, he, uh, he's gone down and tracked a lot of that. Now, these guys have then gone out and, and their whole sort of uh, obsession spread out to others and uh, it spread throughout and that would help generate the uh, cocktail uh, revival. Dale DeGroff in particular worked with someone named Audrey Saunders who then went open the Pegu Club in New York. She in turn hired uh, another obsessive named Jim Meehan uh, who worked with her and then he went and opened the, the PDT bar in New York uh, and it's all spread out from there. Uh, it's, it's great to see how just a, a, a small group of obsessives can really affect something. Um, what happened though is as it's grown bigger and more uh, uh, it's drawn in more people that the, uh, it, it, we, we start seeing a shift and it goes from a subculture of obsessives to pop culture of mass media. And I think we're starting to see some of the, this cocktail uh, revival starting to flag a little bit uh, because of that. Uh, you're getting people that are coming in, the bartenders are coming into the bars and they're not so much obsessed with craft they like the concept of a craft bar. They're coming in and just sort of going through the motions. They're attracted to the limelight. Um, and and I, it's a little bit sad to see that uh, starting to happen. Um, but th that seems to be how the cycle is going. Um, the, uh, if you go if in these craft cocktail bars uh, and you look behind the, uh, the, sh the back bar, you're going to see lots of more interesting uh, types of of uh, bottles that are appearing these days. It's not the stuff of our grandfather, my father's generation, well, the Canadian Club and the Smirnoff and, and whatnot. Uh, lots more obscure and interesting craft uh, uh, products are appearing uh, all across the country. Um, Here's some that we're seeing uh, crop up, and there's just been a huge boom right now in craft distilling. It's really spreading widely and far. It's um, when I started about 10 years ago, I think there were maybe two or three dozen craft distillers, and now there are uh, somewhere between five and 600, and it's growing uh, day by day. Uh, there are projections for 100 uh, craft distillers to open every year for the next uh, six years. Um, it's been a remarkable uh, ride to see that happen. Uh, we've got some folks here, I think, from... Uh, from New Holland Distilling, uh, that are producing some great things. I mean, you're seeing some great stuff, the blue uh, corn bourbon out of Texas and the like. Uh, it's continuing to expand. Uh, every craft distiller that I've come across that started five years ago or earlier is now in the process of expansion, including New, uh, New Holland. Uh, the, another good example is uh, Todd Leopold. Uh, some of you may know, was, uh, started in Ann Arbor with a brew pub, and that grew. Uh, to a distillery. He moved to Colorado in 2008. Uh, he's producing some of the finest uh, artisan spirits, I think, that are out there, uh, including um, a Michigan sour cherry liqueur and a Maryland-style rye. It's the type of rye that we really haven't seen in 150 years. Uh, but again, with the, as with the craft bars, a lot of smaller obsessives have started with craft distilling, and as it's grown and as it's expanded and as it's become more... Uh, uh, lucrative, it's drawing in a lot of outsiders. And we're starting to see a lot of what I consider to be sort of fake craft coming into the area. Again, the switch from uh, actual craft to sort of a concept of craft uh, that's happening. And the uh, <clears throat> couple examples, there's one uh, distillery I went to where they were importing uh, Beverage ethanol, which is basically bever you know, potable alcohol from a big distiller that you can get them from Cargill or others. Uh, bring them to his distillery, running them through a charcoal filter, and then calling it a, a local craft product, a local craft vodka. There's a uh, producer in New York City that brings out industrial uh, ethanol to Brooklyn. He cuts it with Brooklyn tap water, and then he labels it handcrafted in Brooklyn. Um, it's... Uh, yeah, it, it's sad to see that because I think it starts sucking some of the oxygen out of the, uh, the actual craft. Craft becomes much harder. It takes a lot of work to uh, produce uh, craft from using your own grain, uh, doing your own fermentation, but if you can just bottle it and call it craft and sell it for a couple dollars less, I think it cu starts cutting the uh, business pretty sharply. Um, 
the, uh, the, the, the interesting trick about this is that there is no definition for craft spirits. And you can, anyone can call anything craft if they want. It's like green, there's no federal definition. Uh, the craft spirits industry, I think, is starting to try to figure out how to uh, tie this together. Uh, and come up with some definition that they can agree upon. Uh, although it's, it's uh, I don't think it's going to happen. There's a lot of intermediate type things. Gin, which is made with industrial ethanol, can also be, the craft there, it really comes in the, the um, adding uh, the, the, uh, the herbs and the spices and the citrus peels to, to give it the flavor. So you can't really uh, fold that underneath there. Uh, so there's, I don't think we're ever going to get any definition from the industry itself. Um, the... What's, so what, I, th I think that's not a bad thing. I think it's okay that it, if it get, gets kicked back to us, it allows us, the consumer, to actually define craft and decide what it is. In essence, craft, we now own the term craft. Uh, but with the uh, ownership comes responsibility. I think we have to decide and go out and educate ourselves and figure out what it is that uh, we value and what, how we want to decide whether something is craft or something is not craft. Um, I think that's worth doing, though, because I think with craft is when you're making your connection to people, place, and time. Uh, fake craft, you're not, you're not making that connection whatsoever. Um, sometimes professionally, but often not, when I'm traveling, I will go to a craft cocktail bar uh, and, and seek refuge there. Uh, I often order a, uh, an old-fashioned cocktail. Uh, it's sort of my comfort cocktail. My grandfather used to drink it, uh, and more so I like the fact that it is connected to 200 years of, uh, of history, um, all the way through back to people who have been having it across uh, place and time. Um, it's really the distilled essence of a historic cocktail. Um, I'll sit in a bar, I'll pick a whiskey off the back, uh, preferably one from a distiller that I know, um, uh, and, and from a distillery that I visited. I'll ask the bartender which bitters he would suggest. Hopefully he has a story about it. He'll make it, he'll set it in front of me, I'll take a sip, and it warms me in, in many ways. Uh, I, I feel it there, the connection with people, place, and the past, just with a, a, a small sip. I feel at home in the world. So I hope that all of you can find some connection to true craft. It might not be at a craft cocktail bar. Uh, maybe you don't drink. It might be at a farmer's market or an art gallery, uh, but it's worth making that effort to, to, I think, find it and make that connection. Uh, so embrace craft, embrace subcultures that produce these creative ideas, uh, and embrace uh, anything that can pr connect you to the past in that way. Uh, one final bit of advice, uh, if you go to a hipster bar and someone offers to paint your nails, tell them no thanks. <laughs> Thank you.